Another question now from a viewer, and that's Richard A. He said, I wanted to know more about external charging points, as it looks like to the regs that you need an earth rod for each external charging point. That's I see point. not the case, but we can see where you got there, Richard. So we need to draw a distinction here between or what type of system we're talking about, because if you were considering putting in a charging point with a TT, with a, that's a totally different system. We're not talking about that now. We're talking about supplementary protection for a PME system. Okay, yeah. yeah. I think it's best to sort of set out the scenario, really. Yeah. Why are we doing that? In section 722, which covers electrical vehicle charging points, uh, there's, a, there's a particular point made about TN systems, and in particular, a PME scenario, and why there is a risk. Okay, now this isn't sort of spelt out in the requirements, but this is a nice little picture to explain it. So basically we have our supply coming into the installation and obviously a return path there via the neutral, via the pen conductor. Now that pen conductor is an earth and a neutral, so it's combined, all right? But what can happen, although they say it doesn't, but it can, is that you can have a break in it, it okay? Does. And uh, through a lot of research and hard work, a number of organizations have been able to establish that it's happening sort of th high 300, 400 times a year which we know is 365 days. It's one a day. Yeah. And the percentage. And increasing. Uh, and increasing. Probably the age, probably the deter um, deterioration of connections. Like that. Never mind that. You know, it's, it's, it's a fact of life. Things do break down and do wear out. So if. You talk about yourself, Gary. <laughs> well, not, not today. We're on, we're on good, good form today. So if you end up with a broken neutral, okay, the um, return path will look for an alternative way to get back. And what it does is it comes back to the uh, neutral point in the um, installation, and there's, there's a link there to the earth. It will try and find an alternative path. And if you've got um, uh, gas pipes, water pipes and that, it will try and go down there. But in this particular case, we've exported it out through to this vehicle, mm. okay? So if you've got a person in contact with that vehicle and touching earth, this will be a, a raised in potential, okay? And you are at risk of electric shock, which could be fatal. Okay, so there's the problem that the regs are trying to sort out. Yes. Uh, and when we look to 722.411.4.1, it talks about that very situation in a TN system, a PME earthing facility shall not be used as a means of earthing for the protective conductor contact to the charging point located outdoors, or that might be reasonably expected yeah, that's, to be that used, that one. And it gives us three options as effectively supplementary protection there, if, if we want to do that. The charging point forms part of a three-phase installation. Right, well that's okay if you're in a commercial application or you've got a factory or a warehouse or anything like that, mm -hmm. maybe on a car showroom. Yeah. And they, they, they have to be evenly loaded. Evenly loaded. Uh, I mean, it, this is sort of eliminating basic um, simple single phase installation, so your typical house dwelling is not going to have a three phase supply, so that's that's a no okay, brainer. So that and up. even if you are in a commercial environment, you'd want to monitor you know, the, the, the line currents for a period of time. I mean, it's not specified there, but it certainly, certainly wouldn't be a clamp meter and sort of like to take three readings in, in a half hour period because time, loading, shift patterns and all that, they'll have a massive impact on, on you know, how, they, they are, how the whole thing works over a period of months, if not a year. Okay. Number two then, the main earthing terminal of the installation is connected to an installation earth electro by a protective conductor. And it goes on to detail just like how, this. but like that. Yeah. So let me just flick between the two. So basically, I mean, it's shown there. I mean, it's just for convenience there, but it's, it's the main earthing terminal. It's, this is the supplementary earth electrode. Mm. This is not TT. This is basically stating that if you end up with a broken neutral, there is an alternative path. And the more that we have of those, and we'll possibly see this coming in an amendment. We should, we should cover that up because at this point, that isn't broken, is it? That isn't broken. So, no. so this is just standing yes. by in case that. And broke. there was a proposal in the 18th edition for those that had the DPC that, that would have seen it was like this and was like, <laughs> oh, what do we do? So you know, it, it didn't make it into that um, edition yeah. at the time, but it may return in. It a showed point. a way of thinking, didn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And What's happened over uh, a number of years, Dave, is that we've gone from gas metallic pipes supplying our properties and lead pipes coming into the property, all being replaced with um, plastic pipes. Mm. So we've lost all our parallel earth paths. So it's getting not more and more dangerous, but more and more difficult to that. So this was one solution. Whether we see foundation earth in sort of coming in to um, supplement this, we'll, we'll see. But basically it's an option to help uh, eliminate the risk or minimize it. I'm not gonna say eliminate it, minimize it's probably a better way. Okay, but it has its own problems, doesn't it? Uh, yes, uh, and whether we're sort of touching on TT or the supplementary overlay road, there are a number of, I'm going to say, 
interested parties um, that do worry about the um, banging in of an earth electrode, mm. right? You've, you, you run the risk of hitting a service pipe, gas, sewage pipe, or something like that. And never mind the fact that you've got maintenance, because no one's ever going to look at that and sort of And actually achieving it. the required resistance on this is not the easiest Yes, thing I mean, it. that requirement in there does go on to specify that you need to make sure that in the event of open fire, you still don't go above 70 volts. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need to do some serious maths, which are given in the annex. But we are in a serious situation in that if there is a problem, uh, the um, RCD in the house won't necessarily pick it up, will it? No. But we I'm, go into that in our... On the yeah, it, uh, it really great. I mean, I, I love that animation. And do you remember that toast one? That was, toast. So if you haven't seen it, that's a good one. Most people think that because you've got an RCD, it will pick that up. But I'm not going to go into any detail here. It can't. It's just the first principle is it just won't work. So we have, there's number two, and it's not yet an ideal solution. Then we have number three. A protection against electric shock is provided by a device which disconnects the charging point from the live conductors of the supply and from protected earth in accordance with regulation 543.3.3 and it goes on a bit. Now, until recently we were saying no such device exists, but in fact they are now starting to appear in various forms, sometimes yeah, so involved with the charging me mechanism itself. Yeah, it could be. I mean, uh, there's a little bit more detail in there that we could just tease out there. The um that this particular device that they're talking about never existed in the 17th edition. You know, I think it was Amendment 2 when it came out. It was looking to sort of monitor, monitor the neutral, uh, and even if you had an RCD and it tripped, the protective conductor is still in contact with the out, yeah. outside metal work. So if, even if it disconnected the line of neutral and there was a rise in the potential there, it would probably still export out. So it needs to disconnect the protective conductor at the same time. That's, that's it. And its operation time is less than four seconds for a 70 volt rise? Uh, well, f between four and five, really, because on the four seconds, is you know, <laughs> you wouldn't want to get home at night after a long day, plug in your charge, and there was a little power outage at two o'clock in the morning, and for three seconds, and the thing didn't sort of re engage, and you come out and you've got flat battery. So basically, it's given a little bit of time, but obviously, uh, if you've done all your uh, courses and training, we don't really want any metal work to be live for more than five seconds. So there's a bit of a compromise there. So. But again, it's, uh, so although these devices are available and getting better and and proving to be they could be the the go-to place at the moment, it's still a very confusing field to be in, isn't it? And if you're going to do any serious amount of electrical vehicle charging points, you really need to go on a course. You do. This is well, I mean, by the very nature that it's in uh, part seven, makes it a special installation and or a location. I mean, think about this uh, vehicle. It's several meters long. The flex flexible cable could be. Meters really depending mm. on how you got it. So if you're touching that, and I know you wouldn't lean over your next door neighbours and touch their earth in uh, metal light fitting, you, you can see the complications. So yes, there is a, a code of practice. Uh, the IET do that, and it's I think a course, good good one day, two day course. So really get to the bottom of um, you know the requirements for the um, heights of sockets and lengths of cables and the electric shock risk, and possibly even work through all the calculations that you need to do. But there's not, that's not the only option. Nope. We can do one more uh, yeah. because uh, covering the IET's helpline and the ECA helpline, that I get a lot of calls about I, uh, transformers, se yep. electrical separation. So 72.413.1.2, this protective measure shall be limited to the supply of one electric vehicle supplied from one unearthed source. The circuit should be supplied through a fixed isolating transformer complying with BSEN 6155824. Okay. Boiling that down, it's it's a little transformer, you know, for single phase. So you've got a 16 amp uh, single phase circuit to a 300 quid, right? Plus the cost to install it. If you go up to a 32 amp, which is a bit more beefier, isn't it? You know, we're looking at 800 pounds. And if you're looking for a 63 amp three phase super duper charger, 1600 pounds. So a lot of money, but obviously you need the space. Price is correct at time of recording. Oh, of course. And if you're watching this on playback, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> Um, the other thing I want to mention was that um, separating these systems, so this is one of the things that gets brought out on the course, is that typically on a domestic property, you've got brick-built house, etc., etc. so you could do the TT arrangement. But if you're working on an industrial site or a sort of a scenario where you've got a metallic building, steel stanchions in the ground, and you give yourself a couple of three metres, so if you've heard this rule here, you've got a little distance, so you can't physically touch the two component parts. You know, any drop in, or if you have an open circuit um, neutral, the voltage will rise, you can have a difference in, but you've got this steel work going into the ground, this is going to have a massive impact on the electrode, so your one little rod versus all of that is, just doesn't make sense really, so people are looking at this and you need to watch this space to see whether we're going to continue connecting to PME by these special safety devices built into the device, 
charging point or not, and uh, just to see if we can make this even safer. So those conversations are happening? They're happening. I've, I've seen a bit on the internet and I've had conversations with various people. It's Things are moving. So, What a surprise. Maybe. Things may change again. Things may change again. So Gary, just to quickly go back to the question, uh, Richard wanted to know more about charging points. Well, hopefully we've said a bit course, more. But the one particular thing he picks up is he said he's interpreted from the regs that you need an earth rod for each external charging point. I think the answer to that is... You don't. Yeah, you don't. I mean, the bits that we covered, if it's TNCS, it's at the uh, main earthing terminal as a supplementary. And if you were going down the route of separating those to sort of not change the risk, but eliminate it or deal with it, is you'd make it TT, then you would need an earth electrode. So it was possible. So I've given you both scenarios to sort of uh, differentiate the two. And in the event of option three with the piece of kit, Oh, and if you're going to use the protective measure electrical separation, this is complete, I'm not say isolation, but basically it's the primary, uh, sorry, the primary is separated from the secondary, so you wouldn't need an earth electrode, there is no return path. But it gets big, it gets expensive. So that's it. <laughs> it finds Gary. We hope you found that useful. If there's a subject you'd like us to talk through or question you'd like us to examine, then why not send it to us? Dave Austin at learninglounge.com will get to me, or you can put the comment in the box below. And don't forget, you can find more questions on our website, learninglounge.com forward slash 18. And you can get even more questions if you subscribe to one of our courses.